So this is one of my favorite lessons, but also the one that often causes the most controversy. It's how to become informed in order to, to be an informed voter. Uh, in other words, we need to build a foundation. And so this is part five of the 14. If you happen to be following along in the booklet, it's on page 41. And we're dealing with two areas here. How do we build a solid foundation? And then how would he stay informed on current affairs? Two separate but connected issues. The first piece to build a foundation is you, you have got to have some basic understanding of the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution. Those two documents are connected together. You cannot separate them and have a full understanding. I put pocket constitutions on the cart. If you didn't get one, well, I get one when you leave. Uh, I thought maybe it wasn't necessary for a long time, and then I saw this young man uh, at, at the hearing that he was at, and noticed he pulled out his pocket constitution with all kinds of notes written in it, and I figured if, if a Supreme Court judge, and he was you know, at a hearing getting ready for that position, if he can't remember the details of this, then the rest of us can't either, and therefore we ought to keep this document with us. Okay? Uh, and, and I was tickled to see that it, there are all these handwritten notes he has, has all over it. My personal preference besides having this is to put the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, get, get an app on my iPad or whatever other device that you use. I, I like the iPad because I find it easy to get around in and I can make the type larger. So as I'm getting older, it's easier to read, okay? So one of the other features, uh, there are at least a dozen different apps available uh, at both at, 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 for Kindle and also for the, at the Apple Store. Uh, to do this. Some of them will cost you some money, some of them are free. I like to look for ones that have got extra information in it. Can I do a word search? Uh, this particular one also gives me information about the 56 signers. Any, anybody else here do this on a, on a pad, notepad or pad tablet of some kind? So I'm a majority of one, right? So it fits for what my mother said, if you find yourself on the side of the majority, you ought to stop and check your premise. Okay? So the other two documents that are out there, one I use more than the other, are the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, I find the Anti-Federalist Papers to have some, some validity. The Federalist Papers are well documented, well used. Uh, in fact, one of the district attorneys that I know carries a hardbound copy of the Federalist Papers in his briefcase, okay? I'll give you some idea of, of their value, okay? How many of you have a copy of the Federalist Papers? Got, well, it, it, they're easy to get, okay? If you've got an iPad, they're, they're free to download. So. How do we build a foundation to understand what's going on in our world around us? Well, of course, the first place, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't put it in here because I just thought it was a given. We need to start by daily reading the scriptures, okay? That, that, that's our truth, that's our foundation. If you're not doing that, then the rest of this is going to be more difficult because it's where, where you go back to for the foundation. What, what is right and what is wrong? What does scripture have to say about various issues? Because it's, it covers a huge variety of things dealing with politics. So that's one piece. The, the other books that I found interesting, and I just got through reading a, two of these, uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm and 1984, both. If, you, if you've not read those recently, I, I would encourage you to do so. The Animal Farm is a, is a fun book to read. On 1984, not so much, okay? Uh, it's kind of disheartening. Uh, one of the things that shows up there is a deal called Newspeak. And uh, I just finished that book last week again, and I'm going, this sounds an awful lot like what's going on today. We have new definitions for old words, and we have new words, okay, that mean something that's hard to, hard to grasp. If you want to take another step in, into uh, the same area, uh, take a look at, uh, at Huxley's book, Brave New World, okay? Now, th those are all fiction. If you want something that's facts, 
my, my recommendation is Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. How many of you have read that? Anybody in here? Well, I'm a, I'm a majority of one again, okay? So I would highly recommend this book as a book that you ought to keep. Uh, it's not very thick. It's, it's written for those of us who do not have a degree in economics, okay? So it would be nice if those people that we've elected to office at the national, local, and state level would read this. They would get an insight into how the economy really ought to work. Another, another book that I, I really enjoyed was Democracy in America by Alex de Tocqueville. Have, have any of you ever read that? Anybody in this group read that book? They got John, John and I, and, oh, there's one more back there, good. This gentleman came to America in the early 1800s, and he came for one purpose. There had been a revolution in France, he's French, and there'd been a revolution in America, and his question was, why why were the results different about those? The revolution in America, things began to improve. The revolution in France, not, not so good, okay? I mean, the guillotine became the primary tool to solve problems. And, and one of his comments, and I'm paraphrasing, is that religion, okay, Christianity, and not, not churches, but Christianity and politics were so interwoven together in America that he said they don't separate those two. They're, they're intertwined, and that's the foundation. That's the key foundation that made the difference between the results of those two, two revolutions. Okay? And then if you want to do a little more of, uh, of literature, uh, Anne Rand's Atlas Shrugged, and I've, recently I've had people say, I'm not sure I want to read Anne because I know a little more about her, and she was obviously not a Christian lady, but she did get here from Russia, and she had a unique perspective about the role of government and what happens as government expands and takes over every aspect of your life. Okay? A, a piece that is, that is not fiction is the book she wrote called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Okay? Uh, it, it's not necessarily a fun read, but it's an interesting read. Now, if you're not a book reader, okay, if you say, well, I'd just rather watch stuff online, well, Hillsdale College is probably the premier organization to go to to get information about our political structure. If you get to their, their site where you can get free courses, you'll find at least these four elements. A uh, couple of history ones, politics and philosophy and religion, okay? Now, their courses, these are college courses, most of them deal with uh, 11 to 12 lectures. Usually it's recorded. Sometimes they're video, sometimes they're audio. They also have workbooks. Uh, they're free unless you want to get the college credit. So if you want to get the college credit, of course, you're going to have to have to pay for that. But other than that, you can take all these courses for free. If you get into the politics area, here, here are some interesting ones. They've got civil rights in American history in the upper left. Then there are three dealing with the Constitution. The introduction of the Constitution, Constitution 101, and Constitution 201. I mean, those are typical freshman, sophomore level, level courses, those two. Uh, how how Congress, Congress, how it works and why it doesn't. Okay? Why it works, excuse me, and why it doesn't. Public policy from a constitutional viewpoint. So th these are all courses, you just click on them, go in, you, you can start and stop wherever you want. I, I highly recommend this in order to build a solid foundation. If you say, listen, I, reading the Constitution you know, puts me to sleep, go here, they'll, they'll help you through it, okay? Wall Builders is another great source of information. Uh, I use them primarily to get books that I want. One of the books that they sell is the signers of the, the Lives of the Signers of the Declaration. So it's got a chapter, 56 chapters, one about each of the signers, okay? Uh, the American Heritage, you know, that's a video series, a DVD series, and so is the American Legends. Uh, the book Original Intent that David wrote, that's not for the faint of heart, okay? That's a, a dissertation. It's got excellent material in it. The place that I run into problems is he'll, he'll 
give you some piece out of the Constitution, then he'll give you an example, and then he'll give you another example, and then there's another example, and then another example, and another example. And it's like, pretty soon it's like, all right, David, I got, I got it, okay? So I'll just go past the examples and move on. But it's got great foundational information. And our Library of Congress. And by the way, all of, all of the links to this stuff are on the handout, and uh, I know that Katie will put that online, and when it's online, all the links are hot. So if you just download the PDF, click, okay, it'll take you right, right to this, this stuff. So this is at the Library of Congress. It's a section called Religion and the Founding of Amer the American Republic. It's difficult to find from the search engine, and that's the reason I put the live link on, on, the, on the site. All right. So... That's one hit about past information. He'll give, give you some other foundation. I mean, there, there are probably a thousand books out there, okay? But, but i give you a brief insight in there. Current Affairs. Uh, one of my favorite authors to go to currently is, is Mark Levin. Uh, what is often not known about him is he is a constitutional lawyer. Okay? He worked for the Reagan administration, the Department of Justice. So he's not just a television or a radio personality. Somebody who's got some background. These are three of his fairly recent books that, are, that I think are really good. The Unfreedom of the Press is relatively new. I think it's about two years old. It's a good book to read to go, how do I understand what is in the press? How, how can I relate to that? Well, he gives you some idea about why it's difficult to use the news to get information. Okay, the, the, the mainstream news. Plunder and Deceit was written for high school, college level. If you've got high school, college level uh, family members and you want them to get a background about what is happening to the country around them, that's a great book. It's nice short chapters. If you want more depth, uh, American Marxism will give you the depth that you really want. It gives you both history and current situation. So he brings stuff from the past and go, here's how that applies today. Here's how what is going on right now in this area is actually a Marxist idea, okay? It's, it's not, a, you know, not for the free world. So then what about news? Well, uh, Hillsdale puts out this publication called In Premise that I, I get Every month, it's a free, free document. I highly encourage people to read it. It's typically uh, a speech that's been given somewhere, and now they've written, you know, did a write-up of it. Uh, the Federalist Society is a good source. Wall Street Journal got to pick and choose there, and the, the price of that is getting to where it's like, no, maybe I don't do that anymore. The Daily Wire, Fox News to some extent, Newsmax, I like the Drudge report. The Drudge has gone pretty much to the left, but I like to know where that group is going. Uh, Rumble is also a good source for videos. One of my favorites dealing with economics is Squawk Box on CNBC. Uh, probably nobody here watches that. It's on from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm usually at the gym from quarter to five to, to six. So I, I watch it in the last hour of it, okay? Now, I want to be careful here. I, I have not watched mainstream news on the TV in probably 20 years, okay? I have no plans to do it today nor in the future. Uh, when I say Fox News, I have that as an app on my iPad, and as well as another half a dozen other news sources. And the th reason I like it that way is I can pick and choose what it is I want to read about. Seldom do I turn the video clip on. Most videos are about 90% emotion, about 10% information. So you can read what they had to say, okay? And, and get pretty good information there, okay? Uh, Newsmax, you have to kind of go back and forth. Same with Daily Wire. I mean, typically it's hard to get written information in both of those. So if you like watching the, the talking head, those are not bad. The Washington Times is that you have to subscribe to that. You can probably do, I think the last deal I saw was three months for free. It's not the Washington Post. This is a, you know, this is a conservative operation, the Washington Times, and it's worth taking a look at. 
Mark Levin also has a, a podcast that he does five days a week, most of the time. Uh, and it's usually pretty current information. If you're trying to stay up on current stuff, it's a good place to go. The Heritage Foundation. One of my favorites is the Elijah List. How many of you follow or subscribe to Elijah List? Anybody in, in this group? Okay. Yeah, they, uh, they have another piece called Elijah Clips that is usually video clips, okay? Uh, a, a couple of people that I follow their blogs, Lance Wallnau and Mario Morello, okay? Uh, Mario will go back and forth between what he's doing currently with tent meetings and then he'll deal with local politics or national politics. Lance is usually much more in the, in the political area, okay? Uh, I don't know if you know, you know, many of you follow Mario. Mario started out in the Jesus movement in, in, at Berkeley. So he's been through the fire, okay? He currently does a, a lot of tent meetings all over, mainly in California, with several thousand people in attendance, okay? So a couple, couple of sources there. The Praying Medic is always a good site to go to. to get, you're saying, I, I, I saw something in the news. I'd like to get a little more information on it. Praying Medic is one of the places you can go. Robin Bullock is a, is a prophet and a teacher, okay? I, first time I saw Robin, I thought, this is, this is just an escaped old hippie, okay? Well, he is to some extent. Uh, I heard somebody say one time, I need a leather coat like that. He's got a leather coat that almost goes to the floor. But he said the Lord told him to dress this way, so that's what he does, okay? So three other people that are in the that, that prophesize and, and, and get the word from, get word from the Lord and, and put it out as prophets are these three Julia Green, Hank Kuhneman, and Amanda Grace. Uh, I like occasionally going to these, especially if they're, if I'm saying, I wonder, I wonder what the Lord's doing now. Because if I look at the news, it looks like, oh, it, we're falling off the edge of the cliff. And you go to these sources and they say, well, you know, got to keep in mind that God's in control, okay? I mean, Satan has his place, but God's in control. And, and so when people start with me with the doom and gloom, it's bad, it's going to get worse, we're going down, down the tube, I'm going, uh, I want to be careful what comes out of my mouth. I don't want to speak things into existence that I don't want, Okay? So I want, to, I want to know what the Lord has said in, in a more positive vent, and I want to use those words, okay? So there are lots of other sources, and John, you put a, your hand out in the back, back here. John has a list of really good sources that, that he vets and goes to on a regular basis, okay? And these are a few of them here, Breit, Breitbart, Citizens Free Press, the X-22 Report, National Pulse, Sea Vine and the Patriot Light. Those are, those are good, solid sources of information. Okay? Now, I don't know how much of a news junkie you want to be. Uh, I limit myself to a couple hours in the morning. I do, I do my Bible reading. I check the news. Okay? I, I see what my family's doing on Facebook. Okay? And depending on what's happening in the news, I may go to one of these other sites to, to get a little more information. Uh, and then I'll spend about 30 minutes in the evening. What I don't do is look at the news just before I go to bed. Okay? If you want to ruin a night's sleep, watch the news, then go to bed. Okay? If you want to know truly what's happening sometime during the day, before dinner or to dinner, go to sites like this to get some information about what is happening that's not being explained correctly in the news, okay? More locally, th these are some, th these are not news sources, but these are places that you can go online to get information. One of them is Argonians for Medical Freedom, okay? Uh, America's Frontline Doctors, the Oregon Tea Party, the Oregon's Firearms Federation, Timber Unity, the Parents' Rights in Education, now, th those are, are good, solid folks. The Oregon Firearms Federation right now is in, involved in a, in a lawsuit to get ballot measure 114 on hold, okay? 
We'll see how successful they are. They've made some inroads. The federal court met on Thanksgiving Day to look at the brief and have set oral arguments for December 2. Now, that's unusual for a federal judge to do that, okay? So we may make some headway there. Uh, Oregon City, the, the War Room and, and the Oregon Citizens Lobby and the Oregon Watchdog are, all, are connected organizations. They, they really are good places to go when the legislature is in session. When they're not in session, not so much, but when they're in session, they're good places to go. Uh, by the way, if you want to help out with the ballot measure 14 lawsuit, you might want to go to the Oregon Firearms Federation website and click on the donate button and put a little money in the pot because they, they've hired a group of lawyers and they bill in 15 minute increments. Is, at least that's my experience with them. The Oregon Firearms Federation, OFF, and it, I've listed it on the, the handout. Okay. Is it on your handout, John? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, John, John's stuff has more to do with, uh, with uh, local politics and, and national politics. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Th this... This is, the exam this is the front and back of the handout that's, that's on the cart that John put together. These are all news sources that he's been able to vet, okay, and feel solid about. Now, I've got, I've got that information. How, how do I deal with that? How, how can I uh, get some idea of what to do? How can I share that information? Well, there, there are two groups that, that I'm involved in. One of them is a coffee cache, okay? And it's a group of old guys like me that have been meeting together for, I don't know, close to 20 years, 15 years or so. We don't solve the world's problems, but we get together uh, every Wednesday for coffee. And typically, it's, uh, it, it could be church, it could be family, it could be politics, but nearly always it's some combination of that. And so when you're, when you're dealing with news stuff, one of the things is to come to this group and say, I heard blah, 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 okay? And usually somebody else in the group will be able to give you some information, or they bring new information. They'll say, have you seen this? Whatever it is, okay? And, and so it's one of the ways to exchange ideas and get some clarity. Now, not everybody is retired, okay? I understand, but uh, have it, if, you're, if you're a man, having a group of guys that you can get together with on some kind of a regular occasion is extremely important. I don't care if it's once a month or once a week, but, but often I've had people say, well, I mean, especially pastors say to me, well, you've got, got to have some, some Bible study with that. And it's like, no, the first deal with men is to get them to get together, okay? And if I said to a, a, a church of men, listen, we're going to have a men's Bible study, you know, at 6 a.m. on Saturday, uh, there, a crowd this side, there might be one or two show up, okay? But if you say to them at 7 p.m. Once a, once a month, on Saturday we're going to have breakfast, everybody's there, right? Especially if you've got, all, you know, all the bacon you can eat. So if you don't have a men's group that you're meeting with, that's a place to show up here this Saturday, Find a table, sit down, talk to some guys, see if there's some guys that you can meet with later, okay? Prayer meetings, there are two that I know of. John holds, John and wife hold one here on Thursday evenings at 6.30 in the Disciple Center, okay? And, and they're dealing with current political issues, and it's a prayer, it's a prayer time, discussion and prayer, okay? Okay. Um, I've got a prayer group that I've been meeting with for over 20 years, uh, led by uh, a, a, a lady who is a preacher's daughter, okay? Uh, she loves to preach. When she was a child, she used to line up her stuffed toys on the bed and preach to them, okay? Uh, but she's also tuned in to, to current issues and current politics, and so... The political issue, part of the reason for talking about a political issue at a prayer meeting is say we need to, need to understand what to pray about, okay? What's going on in our, in our county, in our state, in our country, in the world that we ought to, ought to pray about, okay? And so that's one of the values of prayer meetings is you can come together 
It's a, it's a corporate prayer dealing with very specific issues. And sometimes we have individuals there, like myself, who will show up with a personal issue. And it's like, all right, well, at a prayer meeting, we put you on, the, on a chair and we get around you and pray for you. Okay? Uh, we, do, we, we just cannot discount the value and power of prayer. Okay? Uh, if, it, if it wasn't for my connection to God dealing with the political realm, I'd have given up. Okay? I mean, it, other, than, other than God hand in it, I mean, it looks hopeless sometimes. Okay? And it's also the reason I don't watch mainstream news, is, is you'll come away from that feeling hopeless. So here's the reality check. Everybody has a limited amount of time. Almost everybody has a job, got family, recreation, church. The, the, the piece of this is I think you need to focus on what's of interest to you. Uh, I have a longtime friend that, uh, that's part of our coffee cache, and I've known him for, I don't know, over 20 years. And people will say, well, he's kind of passionate about various political pieces. And I'm going, yeah, well, it sounds like that, but if you want his passion, you want to talk to him about schools, okay? That's his passion. That's where he'll put in time and effort. And if you tell him, no, you can't do that, okay, that's a mistake. Because it's like a bulldog. He, he, will, he will go at it till he's got it solved, okay? Uh, he was a, a, he was a, when he, before he retired, he was a vice president at, at Wah Chang. So moving things up the line, you, you, you want to, who's in charge? Well, that's the person that he wants to talk to. I don't care what their position is, you go talk to the person in charge. No, we all don't have that, but, but I say to, to everybody, listen, wh what is your passion? Okay? It might be different next month or next year than it is today, but you can't, we can't do it all. I mean, there's just a huge amount going on. Here. I mean, there are crazies in every avenue of our life out there, and so my deal is pick one slot and work at it. All right, let, let me do this. This won't take very long. Let me do this, and then we'll, uh, we'll deal with questions, okay? One of the issues with the who is elected, and I know I'm jumping around, but remember we had an election got in the middle of me trying to get through these 14 pieces. So we're dealing with the executive branch, and if you're dealing with it in the, in the little booklet, it's uh, on page 58 if you're in, the, in the manual we sit down, okay? So here's the objectives. We're gonna take a look at what is the electoral college process? What is the electoral college purpose? Why did these guys do this? And how are the electors selected in Oregon? Okay? So it's important to understand that when we come to this area of our constitution, it is complicated and it's unusual. This is the longest standing republic in, in the world, okay? We have been in existence, this constitution has existed without major changes longer than any other constitution anywhere in the world in, in any period of time. So the founders were concerned with preventing and the, the concentration of power. And they got there because of course, both George and Alexander have written that, that their foundation there was taking a look at Jeremiah 17.9 where it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The other scripture that they used to, to deal with formation here was Isaiah 33, 22. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who saves us. There was the separation of power, the three branches of government. The executive branch is described in the Constitution in Article 2, okay? Okay. It's only 1,227 words, and it's described in 10 Federalist Papers. There is more written about this topic than almost anything else in the Federal Paper. I mean, 10, 10 papers, that, that's a bunch, okay? It is the only election process defined by the U.S. Constitution. All other elections are up to the states. To be a president or vice president in the United States, you have to be a born citizen of the U.S., have to be 35 years old, 14 years as a resident, and the term of office is four years. It was limited to two terms, 
And then the president and vice president were separated into separate ballots uh, by, the, by the 12th Amendment. Uh, originally, they were just one ballot. So the, the Electoral College, how many of you have tried to understand the Electoral College? Yeah. Uh, it will almost make your, your head spin. So I've, I've pulled some pieces out here that, that for me, help me understand this. This is, this is out of the Constitution. Each state shall appoint in such manner as its legislature may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and members of the House of Representatives, which the state may be entitled in the legislature. Okay? But no person shall be appointed an elector who is a member of the legislation, legislature you may, of the United States or holds any office of trust or profit under the United States. So if you're an elected position or you're a hired bureaucrat, okay, you can't be an elector. Right? The electors shall meet in their representative states and vote by ballot for two persons of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate. The president of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the votes shall be counted. You know what date that happens? January 6th, yeah, okay. So, so here, here is my view of this, this process, okay? When we vote, when we got the ballot and we check off, fill in the, the little dot for our president, we really are not voting for a president or vice president. We are voting for a group of electors, okay? You with me here? Well, I know we marked the person's name, but we're voting for a group of electors. So the number of electors is one for each Senate and one for each House member. So then the state legislature defines a method of selecting those electors. The, the electors are then selected in each state political party. All right? So the electors meet in their respective states. Each state does this. They vote. They put the ballots into an envelope and seal it up. And then they send that to the president of the Senate who opens that and reads it on January 6th. Thus the January 6th hassle that we, we had here shortly, okay? In Oregon, each party, each political party, selects eight electors 70 days before the election. So 70 days before the election, these electors must be selected. They cannot be an elected person already, okay? This is a, this is a one-time, one-shot deal. This is not a position that you keep election after election. You are elected once, okay? In, in some parties, you may be able to be elected more than, more than once, but it's not a position. You're not there for the, till the next election. You have one task to do and one task only. So these are elected by popular vote. So when we put, fill in the little circle, that's the popular vote. Then in Oregon, these electors meet in Salem in December. Okay. Remember, the election happened in November. They meet in December. They, they cast their ballots, okay? They seal it. The Secretary of State seals it. And then that goes to the Senate president and is opened on January 6th, okay? So each political party in Oregon is allocated eight electors. So why in the world would these guys do this? Well, I found this in a report of the 1787 convention records where they're talking about this issue, okay? The members of the general convention did indulge the hope that by apportioning, limiting, and confining the electors within their respective states and by the guarded manner of giving and transmitting the ballots of the electors to the seat of government, 
that intrigue, combination, and corruption would be effectually shut out, and a free and pure election of the President of the United States would be made perpetual. Okay? So this was the foundation, that they had this as the foundation that they used to come up with this idea of the Electoral College. In Federalist 68, one of the comments was they were to meet in each state, which makes it more difficult difficult to influence the several independent com committees. For instance, we've got 50 states plus the District of Columbia that, that are doing this, so it's difficult to influence that whole bunch. You can influence one group, but it's hard to influence all 51 of them. It says that one of their other comments, it removes the influence of foreign powers, okay? Individual members are not easily corrupted as this is a singular and temporary assignment. Okay? You don't know who these people are until 70 days before the election. And typically, their names are kept quiet. Okay? We, we, I haven't seen them broadcast in the news. Okay? The results of each state are independent from the national results. Thus, if there is a need to recount, it is at the state level and not the national level. Remember the hanging chads in Florida, okay? There was a presidential election and it hung in the balance on what happened in Florida. We didn't have to have everybody do a recount, it was just Florida, okay? So who are these electors, okay? Well, originally the, the intent was that they would expand as the population expanded. So there'd be one person for each house seat plus the two senators. So originally it was one person for every 30,000 population because that's the way the house was set up. You get one for every 30. Well, by 2010, that number was one for every 710,000, okay? In 1913, part of the reason is in 1913, we fixed the number of of House members of 435. The total number of electors today is 538, okay? It's 100 senators, 435 House members, and three from the District of Columbia. You have to get 270 votes to win, okay? You wonder if they could have made it more complicated, right? So election in Oregon is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, okay? The method of selecting the electors is set by state statute, ORS 248.355. is not hard to read and it's not very, very thick. It has to do with all kinds of, you know, of elections in the state of Oregon. So it's a document that you probably ought to have at least access to. I don't suggest you read it unless you're wanting to go to sleep, okay? It's a, Okay. As of this year, Oregon has eight electors okay, out of the 538. So here's, here's how the two parties select their electors. I, I found this, this humorous. This is the Oregon Republican Party. Uh, this is their bylaws, Section D, Selective Electors. In the year when a president and vice president of the United States are to be nominated and elected, selection of candidates for the electors of the president and vice president shall take place at, a district, at district conventions where pursuant to Article 14, Section A, okay, well, Article 14, Section A, the, the state of Oregon is divided into congressional districts. We now have six. The, the, the political parties have groups that are elected that represent those, those districts. They're, they're precinct committee people that have been select, elected and, and they're elected internally within their party and within their county, and, and then they become part of this group. So the voting membership of this Congressional District Executive Committee is as follows. Congressional District Officers, Chair, Vice Chair, Alternate Chair, Alternate Vice Chair, Secretary Treasurer, and the chairs of the affected counties. Well, there are 36 counties in Oregon. The Republican Party has uh, 34 of those organized. Okay, so there would be those 34 ch chairs there plus the group we just talked about. Then there are no non-voting members. That means that this is a closed meeting. You, you don't have somebody showing up who's not one of the electors. 
Okay? Now, my friends over on the other side of the aisle, this is their way of doing this. President elected the chair and vice chair, who is of different gender category than the chair, serves as presidential electors in the presidential election year. If there are two vice chairs of different gender category than the chair, determination will be made by lot. At least one of the two presidential electors will be female. If the chair or vice chair is unable to serve, the remaining vice chair or secretary in that order serve as presidential elector. Okay? I mean, there's such a stark difference in the methodology here. So in summary, this is the only election process defined by the U.S. Constitution. It was designed to reduce the possibility of corruption of the election. They didn't say stop it, okay? They said it was done to reduce the problem, okay?